Okay, hello again students. So what I'd like to tell you about in this video is the software that you'll be using to take your data with. So when you run the software, basically it sort of comes up like this and there's this big empty graph on the screen. So let's look at the axes first. The first thing you see is the x-axis here and basically you see numbers like 5, 12, 1024, 1536, 2048. There's definitely some powers of 2 in here which don't really have any consequence here, but there are numbers at the moment that run between 0 and about 4,000 or so. There's 3584, about 4,000. And the y-axis over here look like some equally sort of you know, randomish numbers. 0 down here, 183, it goes all, all the way up to about 921 or so. So here's what the axes are when you run the software. This axis, the label or meaning of these numbers here is called a channel. These are channels down here. Okay? And this axis up here, these are counts. So whenever you get into these nuclear scintillation counting experiments, this will always be channels, as well as be counts, and then you go from there. So let me describe then what all this could possibly mean. So the first thing that I'll do then is if I go back over and sort of look at the oscilloscope then. So here's all the gamma ray coming in. We've already discussed this signal. The data acquisition box is this um, one here, the black box here, called the pocket MCA. And, of course, what we have going into one side is the signal directly out of the amplifier. So, essentially, this signal here is being sent in here, too. And the other side, you barely see it right here, is a USB cable that goes on into the laptop there. So it's called a pocket MCA. So, MCA is important. MCA stands for Multi-Channel Analyzer. That's what MCA stands for. So, this, this box, which is driven by that software that I just showed you, it's something about multiple channels and analyzing them and that kind of thing. So I think we see where the multiple channels are. Uh, down here, I said these are channels right here. So you have thousands of channels down here and counts up here. So what exactly does this software do? Well, let me go up to the settings here and sort of show you what one of the configuration menus looks like over here. So if we go up to MCA over here and do acquisition setup. Um, does something here with the connection, but then here's MCA right here, so I'm going to click on this little icon and go over here. So the first thing it allows me to do is I can change the number of channels that we have. So 4096, 4096, that would be the extreme x-axis location at the moment. So at the moment the channels run from 0 to 4096, which is a power of 2, and I can go in here, I can change it to anything I want, 8192, 2048. These are the settings, number of channels I can possibly have. I'll leave it at, uh, well, let's just put it at 1024, why not? 1,024 channels, so I decreased it. And I mentioned also at one point that the, the little black box here, the pocket MCA, um, takes inputs between 0 and 10 volts. There's a setting for that right there, and that can also be changed if needed to 1 volt. So I can have it go from 0 to 1 volt, but we won't do that. We'll go to 10 volts. And the other only option, the only option that's kind of important sometimes is the MCA source over here. And if I go over there, you see there's two settings, norm and MCS. MCS isn't MCA, careful, it stands for multi-channel scalar. It's another functionality of the pocket MCA that we won't use in this experiment, but it's useful for the half-life experiment and the muon counting experiment that you'll do in subsequent labs and maybe even quarters of quantum lab. We use the norm one right here for normal, and that one sort of corresponds to a mode where the MCA goes into pulse height analyzer mode, PHA. So there's your... Uh, fun joke for everyone. You can say that, well, I was doing a physics lab and I used an MCA in MCS mode or PHA mode. You know, you just start throwing those, those acronyms out. Uh-huh. It's supposed to be a joke. Okay. Anyway, so we've got the channels pegged to 1024. We'll hit apply there and go back to the main screen here. Now, I don't really have anything going at the moment, but um, I just noticed that the channels here won't update unless I start another run or maybe even clear it here. There we go. So I just cleared the run and you see that the x-axis did reset itself. So in this mode here, it's zero down here and about 1,024 or 1024 down here. So it allows me to change the channels. Okay, so what are those channels? What are they for? Well, you go back and think now about the data that you're feeding in, this gamma ray data, all these voltages here. And remember, if I hit run stop sort of in single mode here, I can verify that indeed as pulses come in one by one, they have different amplitudes. And so what happens over here in the software, what this box does here, is it digitizes this pulse, like usually the maximum value right there. It sort of finds the maximum here. And what it's going to do for the maximum value is it's going to find back on the software over here what channel that maximum value should go in. So say on the oscilloscope I just panned away from the maximum value is about 5. Well, we told the MCA that this is going to be 0 and this is 1024. And we know 0, 0, and we know we're, we know we're expecting a maximum voltage of 10. 
So if the current pulse height that is coming in that's on the oscilloscope I just panned away from is about 5 volts, that's going to correspond to somewhere right here in the middle around 512. So what it's going to do is put a little tick mark right there at 512. And then suppose by some coincidence another 5 volt comes in. Well, it's going to put a 5 volt pulse comes in. It's going to put another tick mark at 512. So we'll start seeing a little bar grow out of 512 every time the pocket MCA sees 5 volts. Say it sees 8 volts. Well, 8 volts isn't 5. 8 volts is going to be over here a little bit. So maybe the this sort of bin or channel at 768 will start growing every time it sees five, 8 volts. Then it's going to see some more 5 volts to go back and grow this bin. Then 8 volts can grow this bin. And whatever other volts it sees, it's going to grow that respective bin. So what these channels are here are the number of divisions that the MCA makes out of the 10 volt maximum it can accept. So at the moment I'm having it slice it up into 1,024 different divisions and it tells me every time such a voltage occurs. So I'm going to wrap this video up because we're going to do a more systematic look at exactly how this works in the next video. But at the moment, let's just take a look as long as we're wrapping up then. Let me go back to the gamma ray spectrum. That's sort of when it runs on its own, looks like this. All those gamma ray energies coming in. And if I run them one at a time, we see the pulse sort of dance around in amplitude, all different energies coming in there. So the question is, if I ran this signal into the MCA, according to how I'm told you it sort of behaves, sampling a voltage and increasing a bin a channel height every time a voltage falls in that channel, what would it look like? And also remember that this y-axis being counts now. This is essentially the number of times any given channel was stimulated by the voltage that came in. So in the example I was telling you earlier about the fives and the eights, maybe after a little while we'd have like 662 fives. But as we left it running, the eights here might have counted 921. So that's what the counts are channels versus counts. These are the number of divisions of the 10 volts that I do, and these are the number of times a given voltage appeared. So about to wrap up, but let me just hit go on this gamma ray signal that we see. Let's see what we get. Because if you think about it, it looks like we're seeing a whole bunch of different voltages come in, just all of them between 0 and 10 pretty much. And so maybe what will happen when we run it through here is think a little bit about all those different voltages coming in, what would that mapping to channel look like? One possibility is that the bins or the channel counts will eventually grow to be totally uniform all the way across the screen. In other words, every voltage is equally represented in what we see coming on the oscilloscope. Well, here we go. I'm going to hit the green traffic light button to go, and if you want to look over here on the right margin here, it sort of tells you real time and live time for counting. Real time is uh, actually how long it's been running for, like on a clock on the wall. Live time is always going to be a little bit less because of internal processing. Sometimes you need to know exactly how long you've been taking data for, depending on what you're doing, down to like the millisecond or so. So anyway, here goes the green traffic light. Let's look at what happens when the cesium 137 spectrum is sent into the system here. So here it goes. Give us a little more scale there. You can use the up and down arrow, up and down arrow keys to adjust the y-axis. That's sort of what I'm doing here. There we go, let it grow. So there you go. There's your first gamma ray scintillation spectrum right here. So you can see these voltages, which appear to cover all cases here, obviously do not, do they? Do, do not, they do not cover all cases right here. You don't see these these channels growing uniformly all the way across. So all voltage are not, all voltages are not represented equally as this spectra comes in here. But what do you see? This is cesium 137. It's a very famous and characteristic spectrum, one of the most common. You see a lot of energies coming in right here under this peak right here. A lot of them, like most of them, are coming in under this peak right here. And cesium 137 is a monoenergetic gamma ray emitter. It emits a 663 keV gamma ray. So maybe the collection of all these gamma rays here, with a little bit of spread in the detector here, could be all of those 663 keV gamma rays coming in. Indeed, they are, it turns out. Uh, let me adjust the scale a bit because you see as the as the bins or the channels keep growing in the number of times it sees a given voltage here, all the counts just sort of rise, and you can see that the y-axis scale sort of is up to a thousand now. We've almost seen 910 of these monoenergetic gammas and a whole bunch over there on that side peak over there. So what the challenge of gamma ray spectroscopy is is I don't identify just what are these peaks. So I've sort of told you what this first one is, and maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. But what is this really big narrow one over here? And why is it that there's hardly any gamma rays in there? 
what is this little bump right here? And what is this little feature in here? But all of these questions, that's what gamma ray scintillation spectroscopy is all about. Taking these spectrum here from a variety of different sources and trying to figure out what is causing all these features to happen. So we'll do a little bit, bit of that in this lab. Okay, so in the next video, as I promised, we'll look more systematically at how the MCA works. So you really understand what these channels and what these counts do. But in the meantime, just enjoy your first gamma ray spectrum of cesium-137, a very common gamma emitter and one of my favorites for sure. Look at how this feature is starting to come in here. Still a real absence of, of any events in here other than a few whole bunch in here. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, see you in the next video.